Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, you are joined joined in this morning to the Minnesota Office of Higher Education's public engagement call series. Uh, the call you've joined this morning is uh, the American Indian Experience in Higher Education Part 2. And for many of you, this may be a follow up to the call we had on October 14th, uh, where we spoke to a number of students and higher education professionals and uh, American Indian community leaders and uh, K-12 professionals, all focused on supporting American Indian students and their experience in higher education. And we received so many incredible uh, questions and feedback following the call, uh, those that accessed the recording following the call, uh, that we felt it was important to uh, host a follow-up call and, and have um, additional questions answered. And of course, uh, take the opportunity to welcome uh, new panelists to uh, to this follow-up call. So thank you to everybody this morning for uh, for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dennis Olson. I'm a citizen of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, and I'm the commissioner of the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. I was appointed by Governor Tim Walls and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan in January, almost two years ago. Um, with us today, I want to introduce our panelists to you. Uh, we, of course, will be joined a little bit later this morning by Lieutenant Governor uh, Peggy Flanagan, who's a, a citizen of the White Earth Nation. We also have with us this morning Dan King, who is the president of the Red Lake Nation College. Uh, we also have with us Julia Littlewolf, who is uh, the Johnson High School Braided Journeys program coach and American Indian AVID teacher. Uh, as well, we're joined by Jennifer Simon, who's the Director of Indian Education for the Minneapolis School District. And finally, we have uh, with us this morning, Adriana Wiley, a student at Hamlin University and a former uh, Johnson High School Braided Journey student uh, with us. So as you can see, we have a uh, wide array of, of perspectives and professional experience and uh, and Native Student Support Experience uh, with us today. And of course, uh, with, with Adriana, have the direct student experience voice as, as well. So really appreciate uh, our panelists this morning for taking the time to join us. Um, I, of course, will be moderating the call this morning. Uh, I'm also joined by our external relations manager at the Minnesota Office of Higher Education, Marcio Thompson, who will be uh, helping to facilitate the open chat this morning as well as uh, take take over uh, moderating duties uh, midway through the call and uh, help help make sure that we uh, we continue on with our call uh, when I have to leave um, a little bit before at about 1045. So with that, um, I want to let everybody know that this call is being recorded. And so uh, feel free to um, ask questions in the chat. And if we do not get to them, uh, we will be you know, following up with answers to any burning questions that we were not able to get to, but we will also be posting the call recording uh, to our public engagement page on the Minnesota Office of Higher Education's website. So you will be able to access the content of this call uh, following the conclusion this morning. Um, I did mention chat is open, so feel free uh, if there's a question you have for either myself or any of our panelists, uh, feel free to put that in the chat and we will make sure uh, we try to get to it. Couple of uh, couple of, of reminders on behalf of the Office of Higher Education before we jump in. Uh, I want to uh, remind everybody just overall, uh, you know, that that we are experiencing um, one of the worst periods of the COVID nineteen pandemic, and this is just a, a gentle reminder to everybody to please be safe. Please please take care of not only yourself but uh, your your family as well. Um, please remember to, to, to wear your mask, to social distance, to continue to wash your hands, those, those simple things that are, are recommended by our public health professionals and our medical professionals and are, are, are so easy to do. Uh, we want to remind you to hashtag mask up Minnesota. Uh, we also want to remind you that there are uh, multiple testing sites available and free testing sites available, including home order tests available from um, from Vault and any information that you may need about COVID-19 in Minnesota 
or about where to access uh, testing sites, please feel free to visit mn.gov slash COVID-19. Again, mn.gov slash COVID-19. Uh, but first and foremost, just uh, a, a reminder and, and a plea to, to be safe and, and take care of yourself during this time. Uh, a couple of events coming up at the Office of Higher Education I wanted to note for everybody. Um, today, on Wednesday, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., uh, we have a session on the Foundations for Middle and High School Success, uh, and that'll be delivered in, in Spanish, in Espanol. Uh, so if that interests you, please, uh, please visit our website for more information. Uh, also, tomorrow, Thursday the 19th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., uh, we have that same session, Foundations for Middle and High School Success, uh, delivered in English. Uh, we also have on Thursday the 19th, uh, from 1 o'clock to 2.30, a, a special conversation on missing and murdered Indigenous women uh, with our uh, employee research girl, B, uh, employee research group, BWOKE, and BWOKE stands for Black Indigenous Women of Color, and they will be joined by the Missing and Murdered and Indigenous Women Task Force members, uh, as well as a visit from Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan as well. So if you need more information on that, um, we will certainly drop that link in the chat for you all. Um, and it should be uh, a, a valuable and of course, uh, important conversation. And then finally, Wednesday, December 9th at 10 a.m., we have our next public engagement call our monthly call. This one focused on adult learners uh, returning to higher education. Um, certainly an important piece uh, we focus a lot of, of time and attention on is uh, making sure we support and, and offer opportunities for adults um, that may have, have accessed uh, college in, in the past and have dropped out or stopped out for one reason or another. Um, these are ways uh, to, to support them and, and get them returning to the higher education, so certainly something um, to to look to on our uh, website as well. And so with that, um, I know I, I did briefly just introduce our panelists by names, but I'd like to uh, offer the opportunity for each of our panelists to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about themselves. And so um, if I may turn the floor over to uh, to our panelists, and I'll start first with, uh, with Julia Littlewolf uh, to introduce herself. And uh, and share a little bit, Julia, if you would. Please. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay, because it's like uh, yes. made a weird noise, yes. and now it's opening something, so I don't know. Um, hi, I'm Julia Littlewolf. I work um for Johnson High School. I'm the Braided Journeys coach. Um, Braided Journeys program coach, and also I teach the American Indian Avid. 9th through 12th class um, from the White Earth Reservation. Um, I also have two um, young kids that are in pre-K and kindergarten. So I feel like my experience isn't just with high schoolers. It's also with like, you know, my children, my own children starting their education, I guess, career too. So it's pretty crazy with the, um, you know, distance learning and everything, so. I feel like, am I forgetting? Is that the introduction? That's great, really of you guys. Appreciate that. And uh, may I turn it over next to uh, Jennifer Simon, please? Uh, good morning. Uh, Jennifer Simon, Imasiapi. Uh, my name is Jennifer Simon. Lakota Chaja in Kawa Kinde. I come from the Lakota Nation and I chair for. Indian education with Minneapolis Public Schools currently. Can you hear me okay? Is it okay, Dennis? Can you hear me? It, it, I can now, yes. You were breaking up a little bit and a little quiet early on, but can hear you well now. <laughs> um, so current director for Indian education. And prior to that, I've had, you know, 15 years in higher education as well, and I have had Two children go through public school and then are now in college. Um, so, an array of experience with education. So, thanks for having me. Yeah, Jennifer, uh, next, if I can uh, turn it over to uh, Adriana Wiley, please. Hi, my name is Adriana Wiley. I'm a student at Hamlin University. Um, I'm studying criminal justice. 
And I also attended Johnson High School and I was also in the AI AVID program and also the Braided, Jour Braided Journeys program. Thank you much, Adriana. And then uh, Dan King. Bonjour, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? Great. Megazans, Nindishinikaz, Jangueshe, Nindude, Marabimo, Nindunjubo. I'm Dan King. My Ojibwe name is Megazans or Little Eagle. And as Dennis mentioned, I am the president of the Red Lake Nation College and also very proud to be one of the seven hereditary head chiefs for the Red Lake Nation. Uh, very glad to be here with you folks today. I'm glad uh, Commissioner Olson invited us, the Lieutenant Governor. We've had tremendous support from this entire administration. I think we've had uh, the commissioner up, the lieutenant governor's been up to our campus and reservation a few times. The governor's been up twice. So we've never heard of that before in the past where we've had dialogue like this. And, and this was the first time we've ever got any funding for the tribal colleges directly from the state. So I wanna, uh, give a kudos to this administration, Commissioner Olson, for really fighting for us and helping the reservations because we are some of the neediest citizens in the state. When you look at unemployment rates, right now, the unemployment rate rates are anywhere from 30, 40, 50%. Now think about that. When we hear it on the news, oh, the unemployment rate went up to six or 7%, things are getting rough. We've had this for a couple hundred years. So we're some of the neediest citizens as far as unemployment. When you look at uh, housing, you know, two, three people living together in, in houses, two, three families. And this, you can go down, down the list. So I'm glad we're here today to talk about this because I think the reservations and the reservation communities are some of the neediest in the state and we're all citizens. You know, we're all Minnesota citizens. So I think uh, I'm glad we're here today to talk about that and that we've been given this forum. So I'm glad to be here today. Miigwech. Miigwech, President King. I really appreciate uh, you setting the table uh, in that way. Um, you know, it really helps tee up some of the, uh, some of the conversation that we hope to have today um, around those very issues that you know our, our tribal nations face, our communities face, our, our urban Indian communities face, and of course you know our students. Um, so so English, thank you for that. Uh, before I get into uh, uh, asking some questions of our panelists, I did just want to note you know I had mentioned early on uh, in my brief introduction that we we did have uh, an earlier call in mid October. Uh, to to start this conversation about the American Indian experience in higher education, and you know, I wanted to just recap that call because it was it was powerful. Um, you know, and we want to make sure that, um, especially in the month of November during during Native Heritage Month, where, where we're having so many important conversations, um, at least for me, none more important than than education. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we talked a lot about. Um, the high school transition, you know, and, and the fact that we can't just solely talk about higher education, but we have to talk about um, our experience of, of our um, our young Native students as well. And, you know, we, we talked about um, that the fact that any conversation about equity for American Native students um, must certainly contain that continuity from secondary to post-secondary. Uh, we heard a lot about, and it shouldn't surprise uh, some on the call, or of course, any of our panelists, we heard a lot about the importance of language and history and, and culture, uh, you know, not only in K 12 Indian education programs, but um, you know, that those opportunities uh, and that visibility continue on into higher education. Uh, we heard a lot, uh, particularly from our students, you know, about the importance of, of seeing your, your culture and, and your, your history and your heritage accurately reflected. In, in your higher education and college experience as well. Um, you know, and then we did hear a lot about, um, about service, about, um, you know, the greater importance of, of continuing education and, and serving your community and, 
you know, what that means that it's, it's not necessarily an individualistic achievement for, you know, one, one to be celebrated by the community. Um, and so, you know, that, that visibility, that, that focus on language, history, and culture, that focus on, um, on tradition, um, you know, it's obviously one that is, is graded from all the answers from our panelists. And it'll probably be no surprise that those themes uh, continue on uh, today. And so with that, um, I'd like to open our first question to our panelists um, with, with this. And, you know, we know that that fall, the fall semester is notoriously a busy time of year for high school students who are, you know, frantically writing personal essays and personal statements, and they're filling out applications, you know, with the hopes of being admitted into either the dream college or, um, you know, just looking to make that transition uh, from from high school to full secondary, you know, and, and given that many of the students are in the midst of of doing all of this right now, filling out applications and financial aid paperwork, um, like the FAFSA, what are some ways? So, question to the panelists: What are some ways to support Native students in the college stage, and more more uh, more broadly in their transition to college? Um, and I will just note, you know. How important are those kind of preparatory activities uh, when a student is looking at a school that, you know, while it may be diverse, may have a very small number of native students or staff or faculty. So, uh, President King, since you're up on my screen here, I, I'd like to throw this to you, but I hope all of our, uh, our panelists take time to weigh in. Yeah, miigwech, uh, Commissioner. Yeah, I think the uh, what, whatever we can do to add more bridge programs for high school for kids coming out of high school and i think the pseo programs are excellent that the state already provides and supports because like we had uh, last year we had 45 high, red lake high school students taking classes at our tribal college and those students end up turning into college students, they're high school students, and then they start college with many credits, you know, some of them almost a year of, of college credits, and they're ahead of the game, you know, and those are free, that's basically free college tuition for them. So we think the PSEO program is great and maybe some ways to expand on that, but even offer other, other bridge programs to support. I remember a long time ago, way, way back when I was, there was the University of Minnesota had a math bridge program where they tied, you know, good students and they invited me to that. So I was like in ninth or 10th grade or something. And so I think bridge programs like that are really good because then it got me thinking, hey, uh, you go to a college campus like the University of Minnesota, that's huge. You know, you're going, I could maybe go here one day that plants a seed in your head because many students are like me where we face institutional racism. And we gotta be honest about it. That's uh, what we're talking about today. In, in high school, I remember my counselor told me that I should go, I told them I like to paint and draw and stuff like that. And they go, well, what do you wanna do, Dan? And they said, well, why don't you go down to the Botech and, and we'll sign you up for a painting program. So I went down there and here he had everything set up for me. It was like painting walls, you know, like, you know, they go, oh, and you can climb on this, you know, 40 story water tower and paint that. I said, what the hell, afraid of heights? What are you talking about? <laughs> I meant, I just like painting. I didn't say I wanted to do that for a career, but that's what they thought of me. He said, well, Dan, you know, your grades aren't that great. And I don't know if you're college material. And here I end up going to St. Thomas and then get a master's degree from Harvard. But he told me he thought I could paint walls for a living. So, and I think a lot of our natives, a lot of our people of color grow up with this and it's just kind of a normal thing. And we all kind of tell stories and joke about it. One of my friends, Lance Morgan, who's the CEO of uh, a great company in Nebraska, one of the most successful in Indian country, he went to Harvard Law School and his high school counselor told him that he couldn't go to college. He didn't have it in him. He, they didn't think he was going to make it. And he ended up going to Harvard Law School. So we can overcome these obstacles, but we really shouldn't have to. So I think whenever the education gaps are as severe as they are against Native Americans, when we did a, a survey 
at Red Lake before we started our new campus in 2010, we had to do a survey of our community. And we found out that the average four year attainment in the US was about 32%. On the Red Lake reservation, it was 1.5%, four year degree. That's not an education gap, that's an education canyon. And you can find similar gaps with all native people, all tribes. So we need to do a heck of a lot to not only close the gap, but make up and start getting that gap more narrow so that natives have the same opportunities as everyone else in the state. Because like I said, we're all state citizens. We have dual citizenship. We're members of our tribe, and then we're residents of the state. We pay all the same state taxes. The only ones we're exempt from are is if you live on and work on a reservation, or if you got a tribal plate and you pay that tribal pay, but you pay those taxes to the tribe, whatever the tribe charges for those services, you pay the tribe. So we're not getting out of anything. We do the, we vote, we do everything else in the state. We're citizens, but the only thing we don't get is a lot of state funding because usually most states like Minnesota will say, well, those are natives. They're federal, the federal government's responsible for them. Let them worry about it. And so then we get minimal and we like we're fighting for our lives as tribal college. Every year we got a battle for federal funding. And they're always trying to reduce and take away. So same with K through 12. The reservation schools are some of the neediest in the country as far as being underfunded. So, you know, the main thing is we need more funding to support our programs on and near reservations and for those natives in the Twin Cities you know, in the urban areas. So that's kind of our biggest need. And to close that gap, it's gonna take even more, more effort, more programs, more support for native students and native educators. Miigwech. Miigwech, President King. And, you know, I will tell you, that's that's not the first time I've heard you use the, uh, the canyon versus the gap. And, you know, that's something that, that sits with me and, and you know, honestly sits really heavy on my mind and in my heart. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, we have, we have incredible challenges to overcome here. But, um, you know, the things that you discussed shouldn't be um, unnecessary barriers in, uh, in the way of, of native student success. So I, I appreciate that. Um, would anyone else, I'd open, and open up the floor, anyone else who would like to follow up uh, in response to President King or uh, have other other comments of your own related to uh, some of the uh, important uh, ways to support Native students in either the college search or transition to higher education. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. I feel like the bridge programs would be a good idea. And that's because um, throughout my years in high school, when we would go on field trips to colleges to like explore options, a lot of students really enjoyed that. And we all, um, found a college that we were interested in from those field trips. And I feel like that really helped influence and motivate us to want to go to college. And also having a support system was really helpful. Even though I never really struggled with schoolwork, just having like Julia and the other program members there supporting me, even if I didn't need it, it was really motivating and it made me feel like I would do well in college. Amigo H. Adriana, uh, Julia, since, since Adriana uh, talked a little bit about, um, of course, you and the program, uh, it might be important uh, if you would just give a, a quick synopsis of, uh, of the Braided Dirties program and then potentially you know, what, that, what that means in terms of the bridge program. And then, of course, add anything you feel with the program. I believe you're on mute. <laughs> I'm mute. Wow. I was had a great intro there. Just kidding. So I work for um, Johnson High School, which is part of the St. Paul Public Schools. And um, the program that I run is called the Braided Journeys Program. And so this is, I believe, my third year working as part of the program. And um, I guess one of the things that our program is like a, a support system. I call it the mini Indian ed because it is it is funded by Indian ed. And um, 
then but at the same time it's its own little like entity but i feel like it's a mini indian ed where it's like you because a lot of the counselors and social workers and indian ed staff would be like you know we don't have enough resources or people to go to each and every individual school and so st paul has um I guess Johnson would be the second biggest like native student population. And so there's, you know, not a, a lot of students, but the support is needed because there is more. And so it's kind of like um, they're trying to branch off. Um, so a lot of what we do, we do like a family fun night once a month. Um, we do in school support which is weird now that it's distance learning, but still support. We do cultural enrichment. Um, um, we've done like made jingle dresses. We've tried some beading, which was pretty hard. Um, and then we try to do um, like a transitioning program from like middle school to like help the students. I guess a lot of it is so Farnsworth is the middle school that's like a, that funnels to Johnson because they're also aerospace. And um, so I go there and get to know the students that are there. So then it's like once they transition, they'll know a staff person of, you know, of their identity or that they, you know, creating that connection. Oh, another thing is that we smudge. And so that was one of the biggest things that we actually did at Johnson. And um, I feel like Adriana could probably add in to this, but we had um, we had issues with smudging at the school when we first started. Um, we were in a small space, and I feel like a, the the non-native teachers, which is pretty much everybody, was like, you know, they shouldn't be doing that. They're gonna cause a fire, or um, I'm allergic to it, and but at the same time, it was like, they didn't know what we were doing. They never came in and was like, hey, what is this? Why are you doing this? What could we do? Like, what, what, what's happening? They're just like went straight to the principal and was like, they can't be doing this or they shouldn't be doing this. And then so we took it and we we're like, what can we do? How can we, you know, do, um, they recommended go outside and smudge. And then so our students were like, no, and then we were, we had a meeting with the principal and he was all for it. He was like, you know, I don't understand um, the issue. And then so we did a school wide education thing and where we made posters and um, the students did an assembly. And one of the Indian Ed staff actually came and like educated a lot of the teachers about it too on our PD, which is professional development Fridays where each teacher has to come in and like, you know, they do learning. I don't know. But yeah, like I feel like we we it seemed weird because it was like we're this far along in I guess the education for Native Americans, especially in like the Twin Cities, like they're such a large um native community. And I went to Harding, which is their like actually twin schools, I guess, or like battle. I don't know how you describe high schools. But um yeah, I feel like I'm losing my thought now. Oh no, me, go ahead, Julia. Uh, you know, really important. And I, I love the fact that you brought up uh you know that the students uh, were their own advocates for uh, being able to smudge in school and you know the importance of uh, of what smudging can can offer for our students and you know staff both native and non-native um you know and the fact that you were able to bring that into a professional development opportunity we're hopefully going to get a chance later in the call to talk about some of the uh, you know ways we can support native students through uh, through professional development, through bringing issues like this um, to you know teachers, both native and non-native, and staff to help them understand you know, where students are coming from and what they may need to be successful. So, miigwech for bringing that up. 
Uh, Jennifer, if I could turn it over to you, um, having seen, of course, uh, an extensive uh, career in higher education at uh, at Augsburg, but also now leading the, the, I believe, largest Indian education program in the state. Yes, I tried headphones. Is this better to hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so again, Jennifer Simon, I um, I echo the bridge programs, the introduction to college earlier. I feel like we need to get into middle school students, even you know sixth graders, to start where they can see their own people who have been through college and who are currently in college, like. Um, Current students coming back to talk to these students, you know, at Johnson, for example, uh, of our student on today. But I think it's a lot of what's been said already. You know, there's just a lot of ignorance in the schools. You know, there's Minneapolis. We have 17 about 1700 American Indian students from close to 60 different tribal nations. Um, and. Most of our teachers are non native um, in the district. We have, you know, less than 1% of our staff and teachers make up. Um, our population and so there's just a lot of challenges there with. Um, again, what's been said of you're just going to go work at the grocery store or you're going to work at the, you know. Not believing in our kids and I see that a lot. I felt that personally. Um, I've seen that with my kids with their teachers and then being in both the college setting and now the high school or the K-12 setting, it's just, you see a native student and apparently they just think the highest we're gonna go is working down the street, you know, at a local store. And it's really disappointing or painting, you know, as President King said. Um, and so I think just building the professional development and having these heart to heart, I call it heart work, that we need to have heart work with people so that they can feel how their words um, affect our kids and affect our community. And so just really echoing a lot of what people have said, getting our kids to think about college earlier or not even just college, what their options are after high school, right? And, and what high school means for their options after high school. You know, we have ninth graders coming in that, um, don't necessarily understand how their grades and GPA might affect them long term. And so just that support and bringing those things earlier, I think definitely whether it's bridge programs or, you know, bringing in community um, folks to talk about their experiences. Um, yeah, so really just echoing. Yeah, if I could add one thing, I wanted to comment on uh, uh, what Jennifer was just mentioning about, you know, there's a lot of ignorance and there's a lot of like education, kind of like how how Julia did that. I, I liked her example of the smudging and using that as a training moment, you know, to share our culture. And so really everybody could benefit from smudging. I mean, and really we should be smudging the whole school. You know, we do that on a weekly basis at least, you know, and uh, it's kind of funny whenever we get non-natives come in one time, I remember they came into the college and they said, what, oh, what are people doing? And they thought they were smoking weed. And they said, what's, what the heck's going on here? You know, is that, is that legal here? <laughs> and we had to tell them, no, they're smudging. That's not weed. <laughs> it was kind of funny though. But uh, uh, back to uh, what Commissioner Olson was mentioning about what can we do to help high school kids, you know, go to college and all this. There's a, there's a famous philosopher who once said, boldness, has genius, power, and magic in it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. And that's so true. And I think if we really wanna be bold here in Minnesota, we should do what a couple other states have done and said, let's provide free tuition for every native who wants to go to college. That'll close that education gap fast. And that's probably the fastest, the boldest plan. And I know Commissioner Olson, we've talked about this before, you know, on many occasions, and he's one of those proponents. And he's one of those people who says, hey, let's let's make a big difference. So, you know, and, and we were talking about this, it, like back in February, we, we had a meeting up at, uh, I think Leech Lake Tribal College. 
that we had a bunch of people together. We were talking about it. It was really exciting. And then COVID happened, you know, to all of us. And we know, we all know what happened. You know, we all get focused on our survival mode and doing what we need to do to take care of our own lives and our own family. And all these other big, huge ideas and projects kind of got put on the wayside. But I think we should bring that back up. <clears throat> and I like that we're having this conversation today, but if there was free tuition in Minnesota for every native who wanted to go to a state school, I mean, that would be a commitment to helping close these atrocious, you know, education gaps. And we all seen what happened in the Black Lives Matter with, uh, with Minneapolis and the whole state and the whole country and the whole world, really. Everybody was starting to see, wow, the unfairness, the institutional racism that affects Blacks, Latinos, Natives, you know, every every culture, every race is totally affected by the day-to-day -day of what happens of unfairness to us, you know? So we have to start changing that. And the best way to do it, I think the best way to break the cycle is through education. To break the cycle of poverty in the downward trend of, you know, just look at any of the indicators in society, whether it's alcohol and drug addiction, the chemical dependency rates for minorities, it's always way higher. If it's anything bad, it's a higher, we're higher. If it's if it's jail, incarceration, you know, getting arrested, we're always on, on the high end. If it's unemployment and stuff like that, where you want people to work, we're always on the highest end. You know, whatever the race is, we're way higher. So the thing that will close these gaps the best will be access to higher education. So I think to me, we should start talking about that plan again. And now that it looks like we got two vaccines, it's gonna be several months. I know we're in for a rough winter here, but if we can get through these next few months, I think in the spring, we could be, you know, getting back to normal, you know, April, May, maybe we have regular graduations next year. So to me, it's very hopeful. And, but I think we should also start talking about how can we can address these, these tremendous gaps of, of minorities and native suffering. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, Miigwech, President King, uh, it's so important there. You know, I, I had to, before I, I respond to you there, I have to just go back to um, the Jennifer's comments, you know, about Minneapolis public schools uh, having students representing over 60 native nations um, in, in Minneapolis public schools. And, you know, if you really think about it, I mean, we have 11 uh, sovereign, separate, distinct tribal nations here in Minnesota, but, um, you know, how unique and and diverse diverse within diversity um our, our urban indian populations are to know that we have you know students representing 60 different native nations uh you know students from all over all over the country um, in our urban centers it makes you know this work even even that much more important um but president king you know thank you so much for for your words um you know, especially the, the strategy around, you know, tuition assistance and even being so bold as to offer, you know, free tuition opportunities for American Indian students. Um, yeah, it's it's no secret, you know, I'm certainly a, a fan and proponent of that. And, uh, you know, as we get later on uh, down into the, you know, the conversation here today, you know, hopefully that could be something that we even build upon in, in terms of a policy recommendation. And I see a couple of uh, comments in the chat to, uh, appreciating that comment as well. So um, I wanted to, I know we're uh, we're expecting the Lieutenant Governor to join us in a little bit here, but um, you know, I know she's experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties with getting on the WebEx platform. Um, so in the meantime, I'm going to uh, pose, pose another question to our panel. And if we have to uh, pause to make sure we offer time to our Lieutenant Governor, we'll do so. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, American Indian history, language, and culture. And um, if you all feel if it's being being taught effectively, being delivered effectively, um, you know, if it if it's not being delivered appropriately, why is it is it being intentionally silenced or is it invisible? Um, and you know, ultimately, why is that important? And I think this is a question that could apply not only to 
um, to our, our K-12 programs, our, our public school districts, but, you know, certainly is something that's, that's equally important, if not even more important than higher education. And so I just want to ask, you know, if you all feel um, if American Indian history, language, culture is being taught effectively and appropriately, and, you know, if not, what, what can we do to improve that? And I'll just open up the, the floor to our panelists. Ooh. So I, I do want to add, like, n now that my kids are in, like, the public school in St. Paul, um, I decided to go with, like, a Montessori setting. So it's not, like, the traditional, like, um, I know there's the American Indian Magna School, which is awesome, because I used to work there. Adriana went to school there. But um, during, I guess, Indigenous Peoples Day, they did have, like a, like, a thing. And so their teacher kind of was, like, how should we approach this, you know? And I'm like, she's like, I have questions for you. And I'm like, okay. And she was like, yeah, so we read this book and, you know, we had a really good conversation and a lot of it was just, um, I feel like she didn't know, like she was talking about like a peace stick. And she was like, I do have a stick that somebody gifted to me. And it was like, she's like, I was like, no. If anything, like an actual stick you get outside is probably better than your like, what does she call it? Like side of the road gift shop thing. And I was like, no, or no, my kids, no. Mm -mm. And she's like, okay, okay. So everything went really well until I watched, I was watching a video that a different teacher that I didn't talk to. And she, the way she was talking about Native Americans did make me a little uncomfortable because she, it was almost like erasure or like, like we didn't, like we weren't here. Like she wasn't talking to like, my children like they were native students today you know what i mean like she was addressing them like like there's not indians anymore and i'm like okay like this is like where do we even start with that because i'm like who would i talk to if you know this video which was probably shared with the whole school in the you know the curriculum but i'm like why do they have to talk about like Native Americans like we're not here? And I'm like, how do they know they're not talking to Native students? So, I mean, that's just was my this year kind of thing. But um, I don't know. That's kind of what I wanted to add. Me go ahead, Julia. Anybody else? Yeah, I wanted to say, uh, I did go to American Indian Magnet School, which was very focused on Native American values. So I did learn and being Native myself, I knew like the real history and the background of the culture and everything. But when I went to high school, there wasn't really much <clears throat> representation like outside of our own program. But, you know, in the textbooks, we learned the history, but we didn't learn much about the different tribes in Minnesota or like the languages or the culture or anything. And as Julia mentioned, we all we actually had to educate our school about smudging, and we also did a segment about land acknowledgement and um, missing and murdered Indigenous women. So, yeah, I definitely feel like I don't think it's purposely being ignored, but I don't think they're working towards implementing it unless you ask. Like our principal was really helpful, and he was really willing to work with us in order for our voices to be heard. And I feel like we were very fortunate to have a principal that was open to that, so. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that, Adriana. You know, not only having those that are closest to you be supportive, you know, teachers and, and Indian Ed staff, but to, to see that commitment from administrators as well, I think, you know, sends a really strong signal not only to the students and, and other leaders in the building, but you know, really to everybody. Appreciate you I think my experience of both college and high school or K-12 now is that no, it's not being taught accurately or very much. Um, there's this thing of being invisible. Um, I think there's a number of reasons that this is. I um, recently now that being in pre-k-12 have thought more about 
our college programs having a need to do more with future teachers um, in our education departments. Like I, you know, for example, uh, I was at Augsburg for 12 years university. I was at Minnesota State Mankato. Um, I'm on the advisory council for Minnesota University of Minnesota Morris that does offer a tuition waiver for native students. Um, and the programs in education, most of our teachers are non-native and if, in fact, non-BIPOC people, you know, they're mostly white women teachers going into education. And if we don't develop our programs at the college level, as they're learning to become teachers, we can't expect that this is going to be taught right in, in our pre K 12 systems. And so, you know, now I'm sitting in pre K moved my seat kind of to that area and having to do so much professional development because there's just so much ignorance. Like, and so what happens then is they just don't teach it. You know, I, I challenge people like go to Google and just Google American Indian and hit image. It will be pre 1900. It will show teepees and wigwams and black and white images like it don't show us today of what we what we are today. And so if it if it is taught, it's usually taught as Julia said, past tense, like we were here, right? Like that. Um, and so I think that we can we should we need to definitely do better in our education systems at the college level, because those are what's teaching our you know, teachers who then are sitting in front of 30 kids or 20 kids in a classroom um, teaching them this information. So that's what I have to add. Yeah, if I can add something to what she was saying, I think she hit on a really good word there, uh, invisible, you know, because I think that's what the way a lot of people look at natives as like we're invisible. And the reason is because we're only three to 4% of the US population. Think about that. You know, when, when people are running for office and making decisions about getting reelected, they think, oh, that's only a couple percent. I, I ignore them. You know, they pay attention to the majority in the bigger groups, like the Hispanics now are getting to be 30% of the country. Blacks are 15%. So they can make a difference if there's a lot of them in one area, one state, one city, whereas we're kind of spread out and there's not many of us. So, you know, there are some states where we have a bigger impact, but, you know, it's kind of rough on us because politically, you know, we don't have the juice as much, but we have casinos now. So that kind of helps, you know, equalize it a little bit. But I think we, we really do need more of the language and culture and history because most people like in the traditional schools in the Twin Cities or anywhere else, they think history started in 1858 in Minnesota. That's when Minnesota started. So, they, you know, they ignore everything really. And then they kind of just ignore the whole, well, let's put these Indians on reservations and forget about them. You know, so they just kind of leave that out of the history books. You know, my daughter's in high school now, a senior. And she showed me some of the stuff in the books and she goes, yeah, I, I have to tell my teacher that's wrong. You know, you got that wrong. <laughs> you know, so she's correcting them, you know. And so now at least they seem a little more open to realizing it. But all the books are all written like in the 70s and 80s. And they didn't give a damn about, you know, uh, inclusion or, you know, societal, uh, you know, representation or, or any, you know, getting our point of view, you know, from any natives or or blacks or anybody. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. We're basically in a situation where we're educating and we got to push, we got to push the, the, you know, the educational system and really addressing the systemic institutional racism that exists. And we all know it exists. You know, we know it's a fact because the numbers show it. You know, if, 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 if everything was equal, we would have equal jobs, we would have equal housing, we would have equal educational levels. I mean, that's the facts are there. I mean, it's indisputable that institutional racism exists, but the difference now is in this awoke, in this awakening of 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 non-natives and non, you know, minority, the majority society, they're kind of going, hey, there's something to this. You know, people are dying here, you know, and from cops and they're starting to believe it you know, because of technology of today. You know, I remember I grew up in the projects in the Twin Cities and we used to, I used to see cops beating up people and, you know, kind of overdoing it and, you know, not just arresting somebody, but taking out a nightstick and doing a number. 
we would see that all the time, but we didn't have cell phones back then, you know, and now with the technology, this has been happening for, you know, hundreds of years since we've had police, you know, but the only reason we know about it now is because of the technology, you know, where anybody hang, having a phone can throw it on the internet and the whole world sees it. So, you know, that's kind of the difference is the institutional racism has always been there, but now that people are kind of recognizing it as real, now we can do something about it. You know, that's why I think it's going to take some bold action, though, to get us to closing those gaps. Otherwise, the stuff's going to take 40, 50, 60 years. And, oh, yeah, we increased it 1% or 2%. Let's make a big difference and do it right now. We can do it. You know, other states have done it, so why don't we do it? You know, and I think natives have been given such a bad deal. I mean, look at this whole state at one time was native country. This whole country at one time was Indian country. This was ours. And so the fact that we don't have it now and we're suffering, I think the tribes have a right to say, hey, you know, even in a lot of these treaties, it says education and health care will be provided. So it's a legal uh, requirement of the U.S. government to Native tribes. And so now that the states are, are, are here and, and they're part of it, too. So this part, they're part of the United States. You know, so I think tribes should really just keep pushing this as far as what we need to do to make some big impacts, not little impacts, but big impacts. Maybe it's President King, so well said and touched on so many points. And, you know, I agree, we're, we're out of time here. You know, no longer can we, uh, you know, be, uh, be satisfied with a 1% increase, a 2% increase. And I'm a big uh, proponent of celebrating success at any level, but, you know, our, our communities, our students are, are facing so many uh, challenges and crises that, you know, we just need to keep our foot on the gas and, uh, and do whatever it takes. And, you know, to, to Jennifer's point about, um, you know, the need for additional professional development, I couldn't agree more, Jennifer. Um, you know, and I had, I had said we, we would hope to talk about some uh, policy recommendations and opportunities, you know, and, and President King and, and Jennifer, you have, uh, you've offered plenty already. And so we're making sure that, that we're plucking out those gold nuggets as, uh, as you deliver them in the comments and responses. So much appreciated. So with that, uh, we are, are joined by Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan. And um, in the interest of time, um, I will forego uh, my planned longer introduction, um, only to say that um, I think it's a, it's an absolute honor and a privilege that, that we, uh, are able to spend a little bit of time here this morning on our call with uh, with our Lieutenant Governor. I had mentioned uh, in, in our introduction, our Lieutenant Governor uh, Flanagan is a citizen of the White Earth Nation. And uh, I will just say as a as a native person, you know, working for the for the state, working for this administration, you know, I'm I'm not only proud to be able to work with with a native leader, but also to be able to um, to have Lieutenant Governor Flanagan as just an example for for our young Native students, for our our youth in our community, and you know, I I know that my my own daughter's eyes light up when she sees uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan uh, because she sees herself and she sees the, the possibilities and and the potential to really do anything, be anything she can be, and so. You know, I'm so appreciative to to be able to work with Lieutenant Governor Flanagan every day, um, and want to uh, turn the floor over to Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and uh, just invite her to share um, anything that she'd like related to you know her personal journey, particularly in higher education, the topic at hand here. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, if I may, you know, uh, walk us through if you can your your journey to higher education and through not only to but through higher education and then you know what do you believe the major issues uh our, our communities are facing are related to higher ed well thank you so much uh Buju, everybody um i'm i'm grateful to be here and commissioner olson um i'm always grateful to to be able to spend some time with you i'm sorry that i can't see y'all and i had to call in um, I'm having some just technical difficulties uh, as we do in in 2020, but I want everybody to know that I uh, look nice today and I put on some nice earrings. 
um, and I'm disappointed you can't see it in this age of COVID when we're all, you know, in our pajama pants. Um, so, uh, but, and thank you to the other panelists. I've been able to, to listen in, uh, President King and Jennifer and Julia and Adriana. Um, I, I appreciate your perspective so much. And, um, you know, these are, are really great folks who are, who are dropping really important knowledge on the experiences uh, of what it means to be indigenous in educational systems um, from pre-K all the way through, through higher ed. Um, I grew up here in, in Minnesota. Uh, I, I live still in St. Louis Park, which is where uh, I, was, I was brought up. And, you know, uh, my mom moved us here when I was just a baby uh, because she had a Section 8 housing voucher. And um, she knew that we'd have access to, to good schools here. Um, and uh, it was a, an interesting experience, and I use the word interesting in the most Minnesota way possible. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I know that uh, I was just a handful of Native kids uh, who was in the district at the time. And, you know, um, President King, as you're talking about uh, being invisible, I think that certainly was um, my experience for much of my uh, K-12 uh experience here. And so, you know, as an Indigenous woman who, who got her education here, I certainly do have a, a perspective. I ended up graduating from the University of Minnesota um, and was actually a teaching assistant with uh, Commissioner Olson uh, in, uh, for, for Dennis Jones um, in the American Indian Studies Department. But actually getting to uh, college was, was quite a journey. Um, I thought that I probably wanted to go to higher ed. Um, I was a first generation college student. And so uh, navigating through that system, I wouldn't have gotten to college, uh, frankly, without um, my guidance counselor, Angela Jarabek, who um, made sure that I was doing what I needed to be doing, even if my grades didn't necessarily match, um, uh, you know, what uh, What would be considered quote unquote college bound. Um, she saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Um, and uh, I, I got into a handful of schools. I went to St. Cloud State my freshman year. Um, and that was not a good experience for me. Uh, coming from St. Louis Park, which where I was only one of a, a few native students uh, being there, um, uh, you know, where we actually had a fairly diverse district going to St. Cloud where there wasn't actually a, at the time, and then keep in mind, this was like 20 years ago, um, there wasn't uh, a lot of uh, interaction between uh, folks of uh, different racial or ethnic groups. Um, and uh, I started getting photos of Native American mascots with racial slurs uh, placed on my door. Um, in my freshman dorm and knew who it was, reported it several times, and the time that any action was taken was actually at the end of the school year. And so I decided that I was going to go to the University of Minnesota um, instead. And when I got there, uh, the first class that I walked into was Intro to American Indian Studies. And for the first time, I saw a teacher who looked like me standing at the front of the classroom. And that was Dr. Brenda Child, who changed my entire trajectory. Um, suddenly, I was a sponge, and I wanted to know everything I could. I took honors coursework for fun, um, and she challenged me to take a graduate level course uh, with her, which I which I did. And I know that my story is not unique. That is the story of uh, countless Native folks uh, across the state and across the country. Um, that seeing themselves reflected in the curriculum and the teacher was a game changer. And suddenly my education was not about me, but was about um, doing right for our community and, and for our people. So that flipped the switch and I was just thinking about, you know, um, the comments about what happens in K-12. Uh, what if we talked about uh, our language and culture and identity um, more often, right? So our little ones are hearing this from the very beginning of their educational experience. That changes everything and lays the groundwork um, uh, in a way that uh, allows our young people to reach their full potential. 
And um, I think those are the things that uh, are needed. And those are the things um, that we know based on all of the folks who are on this panel today. Uh, it's not a secret that we need to be preparing our teacher core uh, to uh, be ready for the students who are in their classrooms, to see them, to hear them, to value them, to understand their experiences, and frankly, to understand that uh, we are still here. Our district has changed now that I send my second grader uh, off to, to her school. And, you know, every time uh, November run, rolls around with Native American Heritage Month or Indigenous Peoples Day in, in October, um, I know there's a lot of Native parents who sort of hold their breath and see what's going to happen. But this year I had um, a really amazing experience with my daughter's teacher. She called and she said, here's the lesson plan that uh, I'm planning on going through. I wanna make sure that we're lifting up contemporary indigenous uh, individuals and stories. I don't expect you to do the work for me as a native parent, but I would love your feedback. Um, and that is the way that it should be done and that we should as indigenous people have that expectation for our educators. Um, but we also can't put that expectation on them unless we're giving them the tools to be able to do that work. So those are the, I think, major areas of making sure that we have uh, more teachers um, through the entire system uh, so that our young people can see themselves reflected in their educators and know that higher ed is an option uh, for them because it simply is just what they see. Uh, and making sure that our teachers are prepared for the students who will be in their classrooms. And just broadly overall, you know, I think you know, making sure that we are moving towards a system where we are doing Indian education for all. Um, so even here at the legislature, um, when I was in the legislature, uh, rounding out my, ending my, my time uh, in the Minnesota House, had a legislator who had been there for quite some time who said, oh, I didn't even know that you were, I, that you were Indian. I thought all of you were dead. And this is coming from a legislator who um, clearly has Native people who live in his district. He just didn't bother uh, to uh, build any kind of relationship or knowledge. So if we can do Indian education for all, it's gonna save us a whole lot of time reteaching people. Um, and I know that uh, the folks on the panel certainly know what I'm talking about where Oftentimes as Native people, we have to spend the first 10, 15 minutes of any conversation educating people about who we are, the fact that we're still here, tribes of Minnesota, a robust urban Indian community, before we can even dive into the kind of issues or policies or other things that we even wanna talk about. Imagine how much time we could save if people just had that knowledge. So that is certainly on uh, our list of wanting to make sure um, that uh, folks across the state of Minnesota and non-natives know about who we are uh, and where we come from, um, making sure our teachers, our educators are prepared uh, for the, the students in their classrooms and just generally knowing that cultural competency, um, relevancy to our students is, is critically important and being really clear that moving forward, we need to be anti-racist and not just talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, but challenging ourselves to do that. And we're working on that in our administration, but it is hard as <laughs> President King mentioned earlier, right? Like the history of Minnesota started long before Minnesota was a state and turning a ship that's been headed in the same direction for 162 years is quite a task, um, but I think we're up for it. Uh, and I'm really honored to be able to do um, this work and to be a, a small part of it with all of you uh, today. So, um, we all have our, our role to play, and uh, I'm grateful that, that all of you are, are in this work. So, Chi Miigwech for, for having me today, and Commissioner, I will hand it back over to you. Miigwech, Lieutenant Governor, and I know you uh, mentioned you can't see anyone, but I will just paint the picture for you. Everybody was nodding uh, vigorously and smiling ear to ear and even uh, laughing along with you, too. And so, um, you know, we, we greatly appreciate your comments. I had you know, three or four different questions uh, teed up for you. I know you have limited time, and to be honest, uh, your your incredible knowledge that you just shared with all of us uh, answered everything that that I was hoping to uh, to gain from asking you the questions. And so, uh, just can't thank you enough for sharing this time uh, today with us. Uh, 
I think I can speak on behalf of all of our panelists when I say uh, for your leadership and for uh, being a, a strong advocate for, for Native students and our Native communities here in Minnesota uh, to ensure that uh, we have opportunities for all. Uh, so miigwech, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Miigwech, thank you so much, Pidamayeye. Uh, I appreciate you and uh, look forward to the time when I can actually see all of your faces uh, <laughs> in the future. So take good care, everybody. All right, we'll do it. Thank you. And it is, this is the first time joining the call, but it certainly will not be the last time. So uh, uh, to everyone on the call, I uh, hope you enjoyed those comments shared by uh, our Lieutenant Governor uh, Peggy Flanagan today. Um, and with that, you know, I think it's it's only appropriate that uh, we take the next uh, the next couple of minutes to try to tease out some um, some ideas around um, what Jennifer had brought up earlier around professional development and teachers to um, you know, try to, to build upon what Lieutenant Governor just shared with us about the importance of um, equipping our teachers and you know even before that uh, making sure that that uh, teaching and, and becoming an educator is actually an act, attractive uh, a career opportunity for our students and so you know what can what can uh, what can uh, our teachers and our administrators in the K-12 system do uh, to support Indian students and you know ultimately to uh, to show that that teaching is a is a viable option and becoming an educator is uh, is, is important in our community. So if anyone wants to uh, to tackle that, I'd appreciate it. I could add uh, one comment. This is uh, uh, Dan King, Red Light. Um, I just wanted to mention that we have kind of a unique uh, window in time here where we have, and this is very rare, I, I, this probably has never happened in any other state where you have a Native American lieutenant governor and you have an, a Native American commissioner of education. And you have a supportive governor who said things that I've never heard any governor say about supporting natives and Indian tribes. So we have a very unique window of opportunity. And in 2022, we're going to be there on the front lines fighting for this administration to get four more years, like we did in this last one for Biden. Red Lake voted 99 point, I think it was 99.8%. For Biden, <laughs> so we, we we vote very strongly for the people who are going to support you know natives and minority people and and the right things that could happen. So we'll be there fighting for this administration. We have this unique moment in time, and I really hope that we can uh, continue this discussion and dialogue and and kind of finalize these these proposals to present to. Uh, the governor and the legislature, and then and then, and then we can help you guys too. You know, tribes will help you go down to the Capitol and do the lobbying and the help, because if we want these things to happen, we got to fight for them too. So we all need to work with the commissioner and the lieutenant governor and to help make it happen, because it's never easy. I mean, if it was easy, it would happen a long time ago. So it's going to take all of us working, you know, and probably the most impactful people are people like uh, uh, Adriana there, uh, students who are usually the most impactful because they want to hear your stories and, you know, the, the obstacles you've overcome to be successful and what you have to fight through every day. When we bring our students to Washington, D.C. to lobby for our, our federal funding, the students are the most impactful. So I think that's a key for us, not to just have us, you know, who are in leadership roles, but to have students come with. So that's all I had. Amigwich, President King, uh, anyone else on uh, the importance of, uh, of the teaching profession and, and the importance of being an educator in our communities? And um, you know, how do we make that more attractive to our students? I think Jennifer Simon, again, um, with Minneapolis Indian Education, I think there's a lot of issues with 
um, having our young people see themselves as teachers. One, like Lieutenant Governor was saying, you don't see yourself as a teacher, as a young person, because you rarely have that experience. Um, the other thing that I found, you know, to being in pre pre K twelve is there are native people who are licensed to be teachers, but have removed themselves from that setting because it's so isolating. It's they're the only one. They're the person doing, you know, all the educating around native people. They feel like them that they're there. They are there themselves. And so I think I think of retention of native people who are licensed. How are we pulling in them in to be in front of our students so that our students can see a native person or a person of color as an uh, as a viable career, you know, as they grow up. Um, other things that I've seen as hiring practices amongst districts and what are the policies and procedures in place for getting people of color. Um, to first be in that position and then to stay in that position. So I, I think it's one introducing the option as being a teacher to native students, but, but that's not the sole thing that needs to happen. And so I think that like, just not wanting to lose track of that from what I've seen, you know, in a district where even my department, I mean, one of the things that happens is in a district, when you're talking about native students, they, people will say, well, go see Indian ed, like their native student, go see Indian ed. Well, Indian education is a supplemental program by federal government funding for their education, supplemental, like not surplanting. <laughs> and so it's like, no, what are you doing for native students that we can, you know, add on to or support of? And so I think that there's just, again, going back to, you know, the, miseducation and things that are happening um because i hear native students say you know like oh i want to work like i was in a position in higher ed like i want to be in that position that was very isolating for me like i was the only native staff member at the university for years and years and years right and so although you have students it's 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 a setting where you want to see more native people and so how do you do that you've tackled hiring practices and policies and having people talk to students about the options which doesn't always work but just setting up um, things like that yeah let me uh jennifer really appreciate that um you know you're absolutely right um i would invite um adriana or julia to weigh in there um, and I do just want to recognize we have about uh, 18 minutes left on our call. And unfortunately, um, I have to drop off, but I am going to turn over uh, facilitation to uh, Marcio Thompson, our external relations manager, to continue this conversation and uh, hopefully get to, to another couple of questions before we have to wrap for the day. And so, uh, Adriana or Julia, if you want to uh, respond to the educator question, and then uh, Marcio will take it from there. I just want to say uh, again, really appreciate uh, everybody's uh, thoughtful answers and, and appreciate you sharing from the heart today with, with all of us. Yeah, um, I wanted to say I feel like it's important to stress to students um, how important it is to see yourself represented. Like, I never seen a teacher that looks like me. I'm a bi POC, and I have seen black teachers and I have seen native teachers, but I haven't seen someone who is both. And I feel like distressing that importance is really important for students. Um, I considered being a teacher, but I'm not good in front of large groups. So I, I took that option out, but definitely seeing Julia um, being a teacher and seeing her growing up because she worked at the middle school I went to while I was going there. So seeing how much she was able to grow her career and be an educator and educate students on Native culture was really inspiring, so. You're an excellent speaker, Adriana. I wouldn't take anything off the table for you. Really, I'm serious. You, you could do anything. Thank you. <laughs> so, I mean, I feel like I've been taking a lot of notes this whole time. And so I know um, as a parent, I feel like there's a lot of like silencing that kind of happens where you want to go and uh, like advocate for, you know, your kids or 
as an advocator for students, it, it, it's difficult and lonely as Jennifer kind of explained, like in the university setting, I feel like that also happens K through 12 because I am pretty much the only native staff at Johnson um, until like Indian Ed staff does come in to help support. But at the same time, I feel like it is, um, uh, the system is set up, so, oh, set up so it's not that supportive to retain like native staff and how not necessarily um, like I enjoy teaching and supporting and um, helping families and trying to build that relationship is a really hard, a hard job, especially when you're alone in this setting. Um, and I feel like there needs to be a better way where it is just supplemental, like at sometimes or even now that it's distance learning, they're like, here, go to Miss Little Wolf, have her help you, have her do this when it's like, you're the teacher, you should be, you know, contacting your families and making sure that they're participating and that they're staying on top of it versus me because I'm the native one that I have to do all the contacting and, you know, where it's like, why isn't the school building that supportive environment and not the native program? Um, I don't, I, I kind of lost where I was going with that. I have a lot of notes. Would anybody have like to offer any feedback on that question specifically? If not, I do have a question that kind of um, kind of hits at some of the information that was coming forth. Um, so one of the questions we had is, what policy changes should be considered to support American Indian students and the community and, and higher education? So, and anyone can speak to that. Yeah, I, I mentioned uh, earlier about the uh, free tuition for all natives going to college in Minnesota. And I think if we used these other states, I think Michigan is one uh, where we use them as a template and you know find out about how they did it, what worked, what didn't work. And I think there's another state or two that, that do that. <clears throat> but that commitment, if you think about it, and we could present that to the legislature, and I'm sure it'll go before committees and all that stuff. We present it and show the benefits of higher education and helping close the gaps, the uh, education gaps. And this will also help with the economic, socioeconomic indicators from all these areas of keeping people out of jail. You know, you look at like like the incarceration rate in our Beltrami County is about 90% natives. So we got Red Lakers, we got Beach Lake, White Earth. We got all of our tribal members are in jail, you know, and and why is that when we're only, you know, we represent maybe 10 or 15 percent of the uh, population in our area, but we're 90 percent of the jail, you know. So, you know, we, we get a raw deal in court. We get a raw deal getting arrested. We get all these unfair treatments and it results of, of these kind of numbers. Well, if we address the education gap, it's going to close those numbers, too. So I think that's what we need to do is to kind of look at you know, having a big argument already and then present that to the legislature and help the commissioner and lieutenant governor. You know, people like that, the warriors that we already have on our side, you know, because this ain't going to happen that much. You know, I mean, who knows what could happen next election? You know, it could be, you know, different groups. We're going to do everything we can to try to prevent that from happening, but you never know what's going to happen. So we have a window here. I think we should try to take some action. You know, we don't have a lot of time. This dang COVID kind of took up this whole year for us. And and I know everybody else, like the governor, the lieutenant governor, everybody's in survival mode, you know. So it kind of kind of messed up all of our long-term planning, right? So now we got to make up for it in the next, you know, year or two to try to get some things going. So that's my comment. Would anyone else like to address the, the policy changes that need to be made? Um, I feel like it would be beneficial for 
a policy to be made that allows students to smudge on campus. And I know <clears throat> at Hamlin, I'm a commuter student, but one of my cousins um, goes there and she lives on campus and they aren't allowed to smudge. And I know the indigenous um, club that's there is fighting for their right to be able to smudge on campus or at least to have an area where they can go to smudge. So I feel like that would be really helpful because it definitely helps connect us more with our culture and it's really beneficial. So I feel like it would definitely benefit all students in higher education if we were able to do our cultural practices while on campus. Absolutely. I have one final question before we wrap up the call uh, quickly. Uh, can someone speak to what degree are local and state educational agencies, such as Department of Education or Department of Higher Education and local superintendents, et cetera, being held accountable for better educational outcomes for Native students? Uh, I can speak a little bit to this from my experience after a year being in Minneapolis School District. Um, I've appreciated uh, TNEC, the Tribal Nation Education Committee, that um, school districts are required to meet with, um, in our case, twice a year um, in fall and spring. And I think this goes to the statistics for American Indian students in education have long been low. Right, there's always there's been this gap or this can I like the term president this canyon right where you see even among our African American students that are generally like like in Minneapolis our American Indian students are the worst statistic in every dis in every statistic with exception of disciplinary which were one percent lower than our Black students in a district like for me that's heartbreaking and for people who've been in a district it's become the norm. And I agree with, you know, Commissioner, um, when he said, like, I agree with achievements, like achievements are good, but we can't be okay with a one to 3% achievement, like increase in our data. We can't. And until we change that idea, we're going to stay with the statistics that we have, because that's how we hold people accountable, whether it be our superintendents and our, um, is not be okay with that statistics, you know, in that data, because it's not us that's that's leading to that data. It's the system. It's not our students that are leading to that data. It's the system. And until we change the system and become, like Lieutenant Governor said, anti-racist and really mean that and have all of our practices stand behind that, our data is not going to change. And so I'm all for holding folks accountable. I feel like it needs to happen more. But it needs to be a bigger conversation and more of us. The other thing that I think needs to happen is we need to strengthen our American Indian advisory committees, whether it be pre K 12 or college. A lot of these universities like Adriana, I'm going to guess Hamlin don't even have an American Indian advisory committee by law. They are supposed to like by law. Every university is supposed to have if they have 10 or more American Indian students. An advisory committee and that will change. The feeling on a campus if that happens and so i think one is just you know holding people accountable the exactly what the question has we need to um and if it's policies it needs to be written in policies sorry i'm, a little, I'm very passionate about that <laughs> well we appreciate you being authentic about it i mean that's what needs to be heard no that was pretty awesome thanks jennifer yeah that's 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 the kind of fire we need People like that, and then our students like Adriana. That, I mean, that that inspires me that we have young people coming up like that. And I like that you share your story. You know, I I'm the same way. I'm I'm half Mexican and Native, and you know, a lot of times we get kind of left out, right? Because sometimes we don't feel like you know we're we're you know we're always kind of uh, you know, get second consideration. So. But I'm glad you're telling your story, and and then keep sharing that story too, because everybody needs to know it. And we talk about accountability. I like what you said about the uh, American Indian Advisory Council uh, being uh, something that every campus should have. Uh, it would seem where well, every campus would at least uh, tend uh, 
students that identify as native uh, students um, uh, should have one on campus as a support system. I was thinking about that earlier when um, President King um, mentioned having uh, a tuition waiver for all native students who want to attend, you know, um, one of the things you have to all we also have to think about, are we sending our students to places uh, that are uh, native friendly and native supporting uh, and are going to help those students actually succeed while they're there. Uh, so our campus is even prepared to receive something like that. So we have to look at it from both end of, uh, from both ends to make sure that those students are actually really supported uh, in those environments and being able to achieve at their optimal, uh, you know, at that at an optimal uh, clip to be able to close that gap. Um, so we can't send them to places that aren't going to help support that. And one, I think one way to to, to make the uh, campuses accountable is to ensure that those councils are there and that they're uh, that they have a voice uh, more so than anything else. Yeah, that's a really good point because we we have like at uh, Bemidji State University they have one of the highest you know numbers of natives up here. And uh, University of Minnesota Crookston, you know, they go out of their way and they actually have free tuition for natives already over there uh, at uh, University of Minnesota Crookston. So that's one school that does. Uh, so, you know, but we want to make all of the schools in the state. So, but I agree, like you said, you know, we also have to make sure that those schools that are receiving the students have the support programs. And the, those are the schools that natives are going to go to anyway. They're going to know where that's a supportive environment. And those kind of schools already have all kinds of support systems. They have Indian groups, Indian support groups, they have counselors, and and they're, they're going to get that extra help because they're actually actively recruiting native students. So, um, yeah, that's a good point, though. We're about three minutes to the end of the call. Uh, I definitely didn't want uh, to end the call without thanking all the panelists uh, for being uh, part of the second part of this uh, very, very important conversation. Uh, I just want to let you guys know how much we appreciate your candor, uh, most specifically, uh, and your authenticity, uh, you know, uh, bringing that to the table. So we definitely want to thank uh, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan for coming uh, to share with us, uh, President King, um, uh, Leak Lake, Leak Red Lake Nation Tribal College. Sorry about that. Uh, Julia Littlefoot uh, and Jennifer Simon, as well as Adriana, uh, for coming to share with us today. Uh, powerful once again. Uh, I know that all the attendees are walking away with information that they can use and with a heightened awareness of the experience of American Indian students in post secondary education. Um, we have still have work to do. Uh, this conversation needs to be had, not only in this forum, but probably in other forums so that we can ensure that we're continuing to do the work that we need to do. So that not only native students, but all students uh, uh, from marginalized communities or communities that have been marginalized, uh, have the opportunity to uh, succeed and thrive in the state of Minnesota. Uh, just to recap um, some things that were mentioned earlier on the call so that all of our attendees understand uh, this. Uh, call has also been recorded and we will be posting this recording to our YouTube page so that if you want to go back and hear some of the great things that were mentioned on this call, you can go back and listen to those, uh, listen to the, the comments that were uh, that were shared. One thing that I heard you mention, President King, that I, I, I didn't capture, I know you said that boldness and boldness, there's genius and there's magic and you mentioned something else. What was the third thing? Oh, it was genius, power, and magic. <laughs> genius, power, and magic. And I thought that was uh, well stated. And, and the thing I thought about was, if you think about, uh, you know, pulling all those tools together as a collective, knowing that we have the power and the genius and the magic to do it as a collective, that we can push, push forward and we can... We can feel that that canyon that you talk about, that chasm that you talk about, not just for Native students, but for all students that that exists for. So uh, we just want to appreciate everyone for taking the time to join us on the call. Uh, just to recap, we have some things that are coming up uh, Wednesday, November 18th. There's the Foundations for Middle School and High School Success that is going to be held um, via the Office of Higher Education. You can go to our website to hear that on the 18th. It's the Spanish version from 638 on the 19th of November. Uh, which is Thursday, it's going to be the English version from 6, 630 to 8. So if you can join us on that, that'll be great. Also, our um, 
Employee Resource Group, Be Woke, is going to be hosting a conversation on missing and murdered Indigenous women. That's on Thursday the 19th from 1 to 2.30. That information is on our website as well. And then uh, if you are interested in joining us next month for our public engagement call, it's going to be on Wednesday, December 9th. Uh, it's going to start at 10 a.m., of course, uh, which is our regularly scheduled time, so 10 a.m., and we'll be discussing adult learners returning to higher, to, to higher education. So, uh, once again, appreciate everyone for their time. Thanks again for the panelists for being such uh, uh, great advocates for, for our subject matter here, and we just want to wish everyone a, a great day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. You guys did a great job. And Adriana, I just want to echo what uh, President King said.